So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, thanks for having me. I mean, uh, even at uh, this uh, uh, late hour, and thanks, of course, to the organizer for the amazing job that they are doing uh, in uh, organizing uh, this conference. Today, I will be going to uh, talk about uh, the philosophical notion of privacy, so a very quick summary about uh, the talk. The talk is divided into two parts, basically, the first part is a very, very quick introduction about uh, regu the regulatory attacks that we are witnessing nowadays against privacy uh, preserving uh, tools. And then I will move to the second part of the talk, which is about philosophy. And the main question of the talk is uh, what kind of notion uh, privacy uh, is. Of course, to be sure, I just assume here that we all agree on a basic definition of privacy that states that privacy is the condition of being invisible by default to potential uh, adversary. If you don't like uh, this uh, definition, uh, you can just change it. It's not important. The main question is what kind of notion privacy is, and I will discuss uh, in particular three kinds of uh, solutions to uh, this question. First, the, uh, a utilitarian. Uh, I will discuss a utilitarian framework. Second, I will discuss the theory that privacy is a natural right. Right. And then I will propose my favorite answer to the, to the question, that is a Kantian and Misesian view of, uh, of uh, privacy. Of course, in, the, uh, in, uh, in, this area, in, uh, in, uh, in this talk, I will touch uh, uh, on uh, different areas of research, starting from cryptocurrency regulations and also the technical implementation of privacy. But again, the main issue here is, uh, is, uh, is uh, philosophical. Of course, uh, between the, uh, the uh, two main areas of research, that is uh, cryptocurrency regulations on the one end and philosophy on the other, there is a strict uh, uh, relations, uh, uh, relationship in the sense that of course, if we uh, aim to defend ourselves against uh, privacy, uh, against regulatory attacks, uh, we must know what kind of notion privacy is and we must know what we are defending. So this is the link between the two parts. So let's start uh, with, the, um, uh, uh, with a very brief introduction. And the uh, uh, first thing that we must understand is that there is a fundamental incompatib incompatibility between privacy on the one hand and the existence of the state on the other. Uh, this is because of two reasons, basically. First of all, privacy allows people uh, to uh, transact uh, freely, uh, to uh, transact uh, uh, um, uh, without being forced uh, to uh, buy a service that people don't want to buy. So basically, the fiat monetary system is a fiat surveillance system, and surveillance is designed in order to extract money from, the, from every economic transactions. And the privacy is an interest exactly to uh, this, uh, 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 to this uh, uh, very existential power uh, to the state, the power, of course, of taxation. The second issue, of course, is that um, uh, privacy allows uh, true peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interactions without uh, uh, unwanted third-party observers. And of course, this harms the economic interest of powerful people like uh, intermediaries, banks, and exchanges, and so on and so forth, which of course uh, have uh, a lot of economic interest in favoring, um, on the other end, the uh, intermediation of every economic transactions. And because of the, these two reasons, we see nowadays that privacy is under attack, and uh, we see it in a lot of different ways. First, uh, most important, of course, for our, for our purposes is the pressures uh, uh, exerted by regulators uh, to uh, the least Monero from, um, from major, uh, major changes, but also the arrest of uh, privacy developers like uh, Tornado Cash and the Samurai Wallet uh, developers. All these regulatory attacks stem from the actions and the, um, and the framework provided by, by the Financial Action Task Force, which is called, uh, which is called the risk-based approach. Basically, their idea, is that, their idea is that privacy is a risk by default, and given that privacy is a risk, it is, uh, it is some, uh, somehow to be mitigated, and all the regulations uh, are designed in order to mitigate the risk of privacy. And this is true, for example, for KYC, for uh, anti-money laundering uh, legislation, and so on and so forth. Also very important to understand, as uh, Arctic Mine uh, explained uh, very well yesterday, is that there are a lot of private actors that are going to profit, uh, that, that want to profit uh, from uh, offering surveillance services uh, to the government. And the first, of course, uh, of these uh, private, uh, uh, private actors are uh, blockchain surveillance companies, of course. So it is a very complicated picture. We must understand that, that we are under attack. So the question becomes, how can we defend uh, our, ourselves, ourselves successfully against this attack? Of course, I don't have an answer to this question because it is a very complicated question, but I can say pretty, uh, uh, pretty safely 
that basically, if we want to defend privacy, we must understand what kind of theoretical notion privacy is. And we must reflect philosophically uh, on this topic in order to, um, uh, to um, do our work when it comes to uh, implementing privacy solutions. So uh, there is a, a huge uh, philosophical question here that must be debated. So the question of this talk, again, is what kind of notion privacy is? I will just start uh, by discussing the first and the, the most common framework uh, and the most common answer to this question. The, uh, the, the framework is the framework of utilitarianism. Basically, uh, there are a lot of variants of uh, utilitarian philosophy uh, and, uh, the common, uh, and the common idea to all these variants is that privacy is just something that is just an, an empirical notion. It is just something that depends on empirical circumstances. And therefore, it may change according to the different circumstances that, uh, uh, that we live in. For example, a variant of utilitarianism is a positivistic or legalistic approach where privacy is defined by the government, by the state, and of course, the definition of privacy changes between the US, for example, and the EU, or China, or, uh, or whatever country. Another variant of utilitarianism is the idea that privacy is just a matter of cost and benefits, and therefore we must understand what, are, what is the, uh, the price that we must pay in order to gain privacy and the benefits that stem from them. Or the idea that, that privacy is a spectrum, and so on and so forth. Okay? All these are utilitarian approach in the sense that they, are, they provide just an empirical understanding of privacy. Privacy depends on some, par uh, some particular sect, uh, uh, set of circumstances. Okay? Of course, there are a huge problem with this uh, utilitarian uh, framework. I will uh, just uh, explain uh, uh, some of them. The first, uh, uh, the first issue is that uh, utilitarians, especially utilitarians in the cryptocurrency community, are never, uh, are never going to define what is useful and what is not uh, when it comes to privacy. Basically, the idea of, of utilitarians is that uh, we can just have a fair discussion about, uh, about the cost and benefits of privacy, but in the real world there are powerful actors, both economically speaking and politically speaking, that uh, will set the tone when it comes to any privacy discussion. And so what is useful and what is not will be decided by powerful people and not, and not by the privacy community. So there are imbalances of power that, that we must take into account. Another issue with utilitarianism is that utilitarians, uh, utilitarians cannot, really, uh, cannot really answer the question why the government shouldn't ask for more privacy violation. After all, if privacy is understood as just a risk, then we, we want to mitigate that risk as much as possible. So for, so for example, nowadays, the governments are just pushing for uh, banning uh, Monero from, uh, for, from, uh, for delisting Monero from centralized exchanges, but why shouldn't the government ask for uh, um, delisting Bitcoin, for example, from centralized exchanges? Because, uh, uh, by the way, Bitcoin uh, provides Pseudonymity and pseudonymity can be a risk if privacy is understood as a risk. And why should the government ask for, the, for, the, for outlawing um, physical fiat cash, which is, by the way, what, exactly what they are doing? So utilitarians, given that they don't have a strong notion of privacy, cannot really provide an answer to this question. Another point, a very important point, is that uh, uh, there is this argument in the crypto community uh, that uh, um, uh, we can argue in a, fair, in a fair way with the government uh, uh, when, it, uh, when it comes uh, to the relation between privacy on the one end and crime on the other. Often privacy ad advocates state that uh, well, just 1% of, uh, of crypto users, of Monero users, is, uh, use Monero uh, for nefarious purposes, but 99% of crypto users uh, are honest people and they should not be harassed by law enforcement agency. Well, this kind of argument really, uh, really doesn't work. And it doesn't work because it is completely off mark. The government doesn't care about uh, uh, tackling crime. By the way, Governments are the biggest criminal organization on earth. So how can we expect a criminal organization to tackle crime? This is a contradiction in terms. But, but, but most importantly, we must understand that these kind of regulations are designed not to tackle crime, but to surveil the people and to extract economic value from every economic transaction. And so the government know very well that KYC legislation doesn't work, that financial crimes happen in the vast majority of cases in regulated financial institutions, and still they don't care. And they don't care because the purpose of these regulations is just 
just to provide, is just to um, develop a surveillance system. Okay? So basically, the main problem of utilitarianism is that uh, utilitarians don't provide any strong notion of privacy and uh, they just delegate this task to the government and they just hope that the government uh, will, not, uh, attack, uh, uh, will not attack them. Utilitarians tout themselves as, as practical philosophers, as philosophers that uh, do not care so much about abstract philosophical notion, but in practice it doesn't work, and utilitarianism, uh, utilitarianism gives just more power to the state because it delegates to it the ability to define what privacy is, it provides less privacy to individual users because basically we as a users are harassed continuously uh, by uh, this kind of regulations and of course it maintains the privacy of criminals because previous uh, criminals just doesn't care about uh, the cost and benefit uh, analysis of the state or of uh, utilitarians. So we must find a different framework in order to understand what privacy is and of course the most important competitor of utilitarian approaches is the natural law view of privacy, according to which privacy is just a natural right. And uh, this theory has a huge advantage over um, a utilitarian approach. The huge advantage is that privacy is understood as an absolute notion, a universal notion, a notion that is not subject to the arbitrariness of any human being. If privacy is something natural, then it means that uh, it is not uh, in, the, uh, in the hands of uh, politicians, of bureaucrats, or of, of a single person to define what it is and what it is not. So this is the huge advantage of uh, natural law view of privacy. However, even this uh, theory has its own shortcomings. The first one is that it runs contrary to uh, so-called libertarian reductionism, which is the theory that uh, there exists only one natural right, uh, which is, of course, the right uh, to uh, property. So there, are some, uh, so there are some arguments provided, for example, by Rothbard, which is one of the uh, most important uh, libertarian philosophers, who state that, uh, basically, uh, the right, uh, um, uh, claiming the right to privacy is uh, something wrong, especially when, when the right to privacy uh, um, um, aims to surpass uh, the right to a uh, property. So, for example, here the reasoning is very similar to, um, uh, to the reason why libertarians do not like intellectual property. So, for example, take, for example, transparent blockchains. So, of course, every external party can observe what, uh, 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 what is going on uh, on chain, right? But if we claim that we have the right to financial privacy and we want to stop other people to look uh, uh, to, what, uh, to what's going on on chain, then we are violating their property rights because basically these are just public information and everyone can use their mind and their body to uh, observe what happens in the world. Okay? So no right to privacy can ever surpass uh, the right to uh, property. Also, the natural law view of privacy has a second shortcoming in the sense that it's a bit static and in the sense that it doesn't take into account the fact that privacy uh, is something that we must fight for. And therefore, um, uh, we should uh, provide some practical strategy in order to defend privacy in the real world because, as we can see nowadays, privacy is often under attack. So, my proposal is to try to define a different paradigm of uh, privacy that uh, uh, allow to, that, that allows to keep the advantage of natural law view, law view of privacy, that is, that provides a universal understanding of privacy, while at the same time um, avoiding its shortcomings. This framework is the Kantian Misesian, uh, Misesian framework that uh, gives the title, of course, to the, uh, to the talk. Of course, the inspiration is uh, Kantian philosophy, Kantian transcendental philosophy, whose main, uh, whose main purpose is to find so-called a priori conditions. A priori means universal, necessarily non-empirical conditions that makes human knowledge possible. For example, in Kantian philosophy, the concept of causality is something that we must use in order to understand the world. The concept of causality per se does not depend on empirical circumstances. Its origin is a priori, but however, it can be used empirically in order to understand the world. The claim here is that privacy is something similar, that is, Privacy is an a priori condition, not to gain knowledge about the world, but to preserve property rights. So it has both an a priori dimension, because it doesn't depend on uh, empirical circumstances, but uh, it allows us uh, to protect privacy in the real world. Okay? So the question becomes, if, uh, uh, the, uh, the, so the question now becomes, uh, how can we ascertain whether a proposition is a priori or not? The proposition here is that privacy is an a priori condition for the preservation of property right. Uh, uh, for, for the preservation of property right. 
we need a criterion in order to, uh, to ascertain whether this is uh, the case, whether this proposition is effectively a, a priori. Here, I use a test that is provided by Mises. By Mises. You can see it in the, this passage. I'm not going to read it because, I mean, uh, because of time. But basically, this is a threefold test, and I will explain the three requirements that must be met in order for, for a proposition to be a priori. So, first of all, the first uh, requirement is that um, uh, if uh, uh, privacy is an a priori condition for the preservation of property right, the opposite of this proposition is unthinkable and is a nonsense to the mind. So, the, uh, the, so the question becomes, uh, can we effectively preserve, uh, preserve property without privacy? And the, answers, uh, and the answer, obviously, is not. Of course, this answer, uh, the, the short answer is not, because actually we should develop an ontology of privacy. We should discuss different domains uh, where, uh, where property can be maintained. For example, property in the physical world is one, is one thing. Property of information is another thing. But the idea is that without privacy, we cannot have property. Privacy is at least a necessary condition for the preservation of property. For example, in the domain of cryptocurrencies, just try what happens when you share your private keys, uh, the private keys of your wallet. Of course, sharing the private keys of your, of, your, of your wallet means losing the property of the coins that are in the wallet. Okay? So it is unthinkable to uh, preserve privacy uh, uh, without maintaining, uh, uh, to preserve property without maintaining some level of privacy. Of course, the practical implementation of privacy is an empirical issue. There are different ways to implement privacy in the different wo in, in the real world. However, the necessity of privacy to safeguard property is an a priori truth. The second requirement is that an a priori condition uh, must be involved in all the problem concerned with a, a, a particular problem. And in this case, we can say that privacy is necessarily implied in all, uh, in all our mental approach to all the problems concerned with, uh, with the preservation of property right. This means basically that when we think about the preservation of property, we must necessarily think also about how we can preserve the privacy of that property. That means we have to develop some kind of strategy, implicit, implicit or explicit, that allow us to uh, maintain privacy effectively. Okay? Of course, which kind of privacy we develop uh, is just an empirical issue, but the fact that there must be an, uh, some sort of strategy in order to preserve property is an a priori truth. And I think that, uh, again, we as cryptocurrency holders, we well understand that. Uh, we know that in order to preserve the property of our coins, we must think about, I don't know, running a full node or using an hardware wallet or developing some kind of strategy in order to maintain, in order to maintain uh, property. The third requirement is that uh, basically a priori truths are not empirical truths, uh, which means that a priori truths cannot be disproved by empirical facts. For example, of course, in the case of liberty, the fact, the empirical fact that slavery exists does not disprove that everyone has a right to own his body and his mind. And the same goes for privacy. Of course, privacy is violated daily in, in the real world, but still it remains true that privacy is an a priori condition for the preservation of property rights. And indeed, this is what happens in the sense that we use daily privacy in order to preserve property in order to uh, interact uh, peacefully and trust uh, in, uh, in, a, in a trustworthy way with other people. So, I mean, privacy is something that is universal and it cannot be falsified by empirical statements and uh, it is useful in our daily, uh, daily life. So the main point of this talk basically is just that uh, when it comes to uh, implementing privacy, we cannot avoid, uh, avoid discussing also the philosophy that is behind our practical implementation of privacy. And it matters a lot whether we subscribe to a utilitarian approach on the one end or to a universal approach uh, for, uh, as, for example, the Kantian one uh, on the other. So, for example, uh, think about the, dif the different approaches, uh, approaches that utilitarians or, uh, or uh, Kantians may adopt when it comes to taxi sanctions, black market, and so on and so forth. If you are a utilitarian and think that uh, privacy is just an empirical issue, it is something that it is useful in some cases and dangerous in, that, in, in other cases, we, we, uh, uh, you will just tend to adopt some, some sort of appeasement strategies. You will focus on white market, on, uh, on the collaboration on the state when it comes to taxes and sanctions and so, and so on and so forth. 
on the other hand, if you are if you are a natural law uh, a, a natural law theorist or uh, better uh, Kantian or a Misesian theorist, you will think that given that privacy is something that is a priori, that is a, a universal requirement to uh, to the um, to the preservation of privacy uh, of property. It must, be, uh, it must be defended in all these cases. So you will tend to oppose taxes. We, uh, you will tend to say that an Iranian man who wants to transact with a North Korean, uh, with a North Korean man uh, should be free to do so, even if uh, their governments are tyrannical governments. The people of uh, Iran are not the government or, or, of Iran. So why are the government harassed by Western regulation? Okay? And so, just uh, uh, um, uh, just the last point on this. Uh, of course, this means uh, th th this is not to deny, of course, that privacy is related to crime. It, uh, the relation between privacy and crime is uh, very clear, also to uh, the, uh, the the father of uh, uh, of uh, the cypherpunk movement, as for example uh, Timothy May, we, uh, who states very clearly that the development of privacy technology will bring more crime in the world. Still, uh, even if this is the case, we should not stop. Uh, 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 we should not stop to. Uh, find ways to implement privacy. Why? Because privacy is a truly neutral concept and uh, instrument. Uh, it can be used, of course, by everyone uh, because it's part of uh, it's part of human nature, which means that privacy can be used by good people on the one hand, but also by bad people, both private and public institutions on, uh, um, on the other. And in this regard, I like an analogy with um, the John Wick film series. I don't know if you are familiar with the Continental Hotel. I like to think. Uh, I I learned to think about privacy as uh, something similar to the Continental Hotel, where different kind of people, even different criminal organization, can just uh, ch ch chill, uh, so to speak, in the Continental Hotel, more or less, uh, without uh, the threat of violence, basically. So it is a neutral instrument that allows to interact even the uh, most uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the most uh, dangerous enemies. So in the end, the question is not how should we stop criminals from using privacy. We won't. Criminal will use privacy because privacy is something universal that is embedded in human nature. The true question is how can we leverage our natural tendency to privacy in order to preserve our property rights? And this is the question that you, uh, we should ask, and uh, this is why I think the Monero community is uh, developing the tools that uh, it is developing. Um, that's it. Thank you very much.